without further ado, um, Michel Gravel is, uh, I've known Michel for about 10 years. He, um, as, as we all find each other somehow, if you're interested in history, we're enthusiasts of history. We all seem to find each other somehow. We cross paths somewhere, somehow. And uh, I think that's how Michel and I found each other. We just uh, bumped into each other in our quest for history. And um, this was one of his publications that uh, I sat down on a, one of the first publications, uh, uh, Tough as Nails. I said, I read it one day. The research is, is absolutely fantastic. I just sat and read it in, in one day, uh, Tough as Nails. I believe it was his first publication. And um, he is a bit of a, a, a legend if I, and I don't, I don't, uh, I try not to heap praise upon people unnecessarily, but uh, Michel Grimaldo is something of a legend on the Arras Cambrai Road, uh, where the Canadians fought up the last hundred days of the war. Uh, casualties were staggering. Uh, one in five Canadians who died in the war died on the road, heading up towards um, towards Cambrai and beyond. And um, the fighting was, was it was a movement of warfare, uh, endless stories. And Michel Gravel has been a passionate researcher of this chapter of the Great War. And uh, I, I would suspect that if you visited any, the Marie, uh, the mayor of any city, uh, of any village along the road, they know Michel. He's, uh, he's a champion of history. He has been behind many causes. For example, the Highway of Heroes uh, uh, is the name of the road now. Uh, and it, uh, he was instrumental in um, generating the interest and enthusiasm to designate that highway, that road as the Highway of Canadian Heroes. So uh, that in itself, uh, he's been involved with uh, uh, generating interest and acceptance of a plaque that will be dedicated to Arthur Curry at the Wellington Quarries, a very popular tourist site in Arras, the underground quarry there where the uh, caves are. And there's going to be a plaque dedicated there to Arthur Curry. And that was thanks to a project in, uh, that Michel Gravel generated. Um, he is... Um, as I said, he's something of royalty along that highway of the research he's done. Uh, endless hours, every minute detail uh, to tell the stories of the soldiers of the Great War. He has a book uh, coming out in French. He's a, a bilingual gentleman. He publishes in English and French, which is very unique. And uh, he has a new book coming out in France um, that uh, will be, I, I believe the book launch is scheduled for April the 9th right now, but we'll tell you a little bit more of that. But um, he's a, a little hidden gem uh, that uh, in the history of the Great War, and we are very fortunate uh, to have him here today. And I thank him for his time, and I thank him for his contribution to history. And with that, I'll introduce Mr. Michel Gravel. Well, hi, I'm Michel. I'm going to try and figure out how to share a screen here. Did that do something? Yes. How's that? There we go. Well, this is a presentation. I'm sorry for people who were there 10 years ago. Uh, if you notice the date, it's uh, the Western Front Association meeting, December 3, 2012. Uh, I've edited it, fixed it, and practiced more, and uh, I'm doing it again on December 18, 2021. I did add some stuff to it and I, I streamlined it a little better. Uh, it's a presentation based on my second French book, which came out on November 11th, 2010 in a course in Quentin uh, called Nous sommes Français, The Canadians uh, et les délivrés des cours Saint-Quentin. The presentation is called uh, The Civilians, The Liberation of a course in Quentin, September 3, 1918. And most of you will probably wonder where the heck a course in Quentin is. But uh, uh, anyway, you'll find out. Now, um, uh, since uh, 2010, I was on a, I rewrote the book. I didn't translate it really specifically. I, I sat down and rewrote the book and I called it the first liberation of 1918. I tried hard to get a publisher in England for it. I was told in rejection letters that it was way too specific. I thought the first libera liberation, uh, the first village liberated in 1918 had broad interest, but it apparently doesn't. So I've uh, put the translation as a website. So if you want to take note, it's ecor1918.ca. It's free. I don't ask for donations. 
but do plan it's it's not like a it's a it's it's a wet it's it's a book so plan on reading like it, it'll it's only about forty thousand words but uh yeah it's like you set up some time to actually read it if you're if you're interested in it now i was very fortunate to jean paul delavoie who was the ombudsman of the french republic now in france i believe the hierarchy is the president the prime minister then the ombudsman and he was also the mayor longtime mayor of bapom so he knew arras very well uh he wrote the uh the introduction uh, the preface in french and I've translated into England, England, English. Um, let's see if I can find it, because uh, uh, it's extremely well written, and it could serve as a preface to any work by any people in this group doing research. Uh, and uh, I, uh, baby boomers and older in France are tremendously good writers. You should see some of the emails I get. It's very poetic. Uh, uh, since 1980, the language has taken a beating, especially with the internet, but uh, this was very poetic and I tried to translate the poetic feeling that he had, but I didn't quite succeed because French is just frankly more beautiful than English. Uh, that's just my opinion. So anyway, he says, uh, ideas transcend all people, their hearts beat in unison. Oh, I'm sorry, I started the wrong spot. Forward, I, I wish through Michel Gravel's work Salute the remarkable events he shares with us, and more broadly, all whose research rescues from obscurity our forgotten history. It's essential to support our local historians. In a globalized world that makes economic borders disappear, it's important to enshrine our identity with our local history. Ecor St. Quentin, the first inhabited village liberated. What a symbol for the liberators, but also for France. The brotherhood of these citizens opposed the strength of the occupier, the brave Canadians facing death, full of their mission. Ideas transcend all people, their hearts beat in unison. Hope flourished and differences faded before the cause of freedom, its value only measured when it was threatened. Our common suffering unites us and we with the Canadians, a common destiny, a common culture. In 1918, there was hope. Let us tread the path of hope and dreams, brotherhood of peoples, and maybe, just maybe, we learn from our history. Saint Jean Paul de la Voix. So I, I, uh, I was really proud that he wrote that for me. So anyway, let's start the presentation. The first time I ever heard of the civilians in Ecor Saint Quentin was when Norm Christie sold me a copy of Canada's Hundred Days around two thousand one. That's live say, uh, uh, the, that's a painting watercolor drawn by his uh, daughter. And uh, this is the actual, the, the mention, he makes two mentions to civilians in the, about these civilians, but the, the main one is a paragraph that he wrote. And uh, I have to minimize something here. Uh, Ecor St. Quentin must ever figure in Canadian history as the village where Canadian troops first rescued the unhappy imprisoned French people. Vive les Canadiens, vive les braves Canadiens. It was a glad cry from the heart soon to grow familiar to our ears, but it was first heard at, the, at this village. 46 persons for four years held in slavery, hid for several days in one small cellar when the order had gone out for the villagers to be evacuated. Half starved, emaciated, but very happy and voluble we found them. Now, uh, so the liberation of the, uh, Livesey was a journalist and uh, the story was known by the media that the Canadians had liberated uh, civilians in, uh, in 1918. Then in 2008, I bought a bunch of Imperial War Museum. Oh, I just want to point out Sometimes people say they work 20 years on a book. I, I started the book in the fall of 2008. And by November 11, 2010, I had my book launch. Just to show you, I, it, it was only a couple of months research and a lot of serendipitous things happened that uh, I got lucky a little bit. 
But anyway, when I, I ordered uh, from the Imperial War Museums uh, uh, a CD with a bunch of um, a bunch of uh, uh, what do you call them uh, uh, newsreels, and this wasn't what I was looking for, but it was on the newsreel, so I'll share it with you. It's two minutes. So I made screenshots of uh, the videos of the different scenes for research purposes, and I would eventually take them to France. But the next thing I did, oh, by the way, I didn't know where the video at all had been taken. At first, I assumed it was in Ecor Saint Quentin, and then I quickly realized it's probably impossible. It's most likely uh, you have to, if you, you might have your toolbar blocking it, but I'm showing Arras in the north of France. Can everybody see that? Oh, can everybody see a RAS at the top of the? Uh... Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yes. everyone's muted, yeah. Michelle, so we can oh, okay. hang on your every word. All right. So, uh, well, I got. How do I get rid of my toolbar? Should it just go away? It's not showing on the screen. Yeah, okay, well, all right. I know what's on the pictures. So anyway, I figured it might be an harass, so. You're on mute again. Sorry, Michelle, I, I hit the wrong button. I was trying to mute myself. So I, I asked my wife at the time, my ex-wife now, uh, do you want to go to a RAS and see where this video was taken for the weekend? <laughs> And uh, anyway, I can't. Uh, I got. I, I can't. I, I. I can't move my. I gotta. I have a little trouble. Just I can't. Uh, Did you just try clicking on the screen? Yeah. No, I can't change the slide for some reason. So go out of show. How do you do that? Uh, probably you hit escape. Nothing's happening. Huh. Uh, oh, I'm out now. There you go. There you go. Now you see. Uh... Okay, there's Aras. So this is the Aras Cambrai Road. It's a diagonal road down a third, a third away, a third away from the bottom. 
A course in Quentin is over here, because you may probably have never been there. To situate you, this is the city of Arras. A lot of you people will be familiar with Arras, and you're probably familiar with Vimy Ridge. So this is to put a course in Quentin in the geographic context. This is Monchi Le Preux, which was on the front line for most of the war. A lot of people here are familiar with that. And then this is the Dury Ridge, where the Drocourt Quiant line was. Most people, historians call it Mount Dury, and the memorial that's there is called the Mount Dury Memorial. But I've been there a million times, and it's more of a ridge. So that's, uh, that's how I want to explain it. So I'm sorry to change the nomenclature after 100 years, but uh, anyway. So this is the area around a course St. Quentin. This is a modern IGN map, but the plan has not changed. This is a course St. Quentin. And there's uh, Dury Village here uh, to the left. It's on the Drocourt Quayant line. We're gonna talk about that later. And the neighboring villages are Rumacor, Sodmo, and Raycor. And when the Canadians were advancing towards Dury, the Germans evacuated all of these Dury was evacuated already, but all these rear areas, these were rear supply areas uh, for the Germans and billeting areas, they, they evacuated the civilians. But as we found out, 45 in Ecor St. Quentin uh, decided to stay. Now, in all the dozens of uh, different sources that I consulted, memoirs, war diaries, they sometimes mistakenly say the civilians were from Sodmo or Rumacor or even Cagnicor. I assure you that the only civilians that they liberated were ECOR. The newspapers were wrong. Actually, I skipped something. Oh, there's the Dury Ridge. And uh, this is another strategic high spot I'm gonna talk about called Mount Robin, which nobody talks about. And there was another strategic position here called uh, Mont de la Sablière or Sand Pit Hill. Uh, that's not, that's lesser important. What's important here is the Hirondel stream. Uh, it's actually a creek and it goes down the valley between, uh, so from Ecor St. Quentin, uh, between Sodmo and Rumacor and uh, to the Southwest. And this is called the Becquerel Marsh, um, which is uh, uh, famous in the area. This is an aerial view of the area. You'll see Ecor St. Quentin, Sodmo, and uh, Rumocor. And that's the Hirondelle stream. And this is uh, 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 this is uh, an aerial view of, of uh, Ecor St. Quentin in, uh, in the 1920s. I'm sorry, I'm a little uh, out of sync because for some reason, uh, I wanted to explain and the slide didn't show up. Uh, before I went to Arras, I checked the newspapers and I found out that the civilians had made the front page of L'Illustration, which is a French publication, a major publication, front page of the, uh, the uh, Illustrated London News. I found them in the War Illustrated and in another French publication. And Philip Gibb, the... Uh, the British journalist mentioned them in his uh, communique, which appeared around the world. So uh, I knew this at one point in history, people knew about the story, but it's, it's uh, been completely forgotten. And the main culprit is that Nicholson did not put this anecdote in his book. So all subsequent historians since then have overlooked the uh, first liberation of 1918. So I apologize, I missed those slides. So now I'm gonna be back on my, uh, I'm like a ballet dancer. I, I can't jump into the middle of the dance. I have, to, I have to do it all in sequence. But anyway, this is the Cour St. Quentin. This is the church, which we're gonna talk about. Uh, this is what a Cour looks like today or in 2009 anyway. Uh, this is what it looked like before the war. This is the entrance of the village. This is the church before the war. Again, uh, church before the war. Uh, this is the main road. Uh, this looks like it's during the reconstruction because of all the bricks on the, on the road. 
And this is Cemetery Street before the road. And uh, swinging to the left, you would end up at Le Chauvin Farm or the Abbey. It's a farm complex that we're gonna talk about. Oh, and this is a picture of the Becquerel Marsh. And I put it in because I've got a funny anecdote from the locals. Oh, uh, another thing, because the slide skip, uh, I contacted the, uh, when I got the newsreel, I contacted the Historical Society in Ecourt St. Quentin. And uh, I asked them if they knew about it. And they said, yeah, we know about the liberation. It's in our quarterly publication, which is just being printed right now. That was in December, 2008. So, uh, and also uh, very serendipitously, uh, they were just about to publish the, the, the diary of the school teacher, Clemence Leroy, who wrote this massive manuscript, a couple of paragraphs every day of the occupation from October 1st, 1914, all the way to, uh, to uh, uh, September 3rd, 1918, when she was evacuated. She wasn't with the liberated civilians on September 3rd, but uh, she does talk about them. So uh, they told me the story of the Becquerel Marsh. There's two guys on their war memorial uh, that are listed with the FFI, the French Force of the Interior. Well, what happened was, is the Germans were evacuating in 1944 and they thought they were smart. They suddenly labeled themselves FFI uh, resistance fighters and they were gonna go get some Germans that were hiding in the Becquerel Marsh and the, the Germans had none of it, they killed them. And that was, they got on the war memorial, but they served a couple of hours in the FFE. And in uh, the post uh, pre-war period, uh, the French army used to do bridging exercises on the Becquerel Marsh. I'm just trying to make you more familiar with the area. Oh, these slides are in the wrong order. Uh, I did something, I screwed up. This is the front page of L'Illustration. This should have, I should have said this before. Uh, there was some unique pictures that I'd never seen before on L'Illustration. We're gonna show, I'm gonna show them to you later. This is the Illustrated London News uh, front page. Uh, this is in the, the uh, War Illustrated. And these are all pictures that uh, I'm gonna show in more detail later. And uh, this is another shot. Now this is pictures of civilians in a trench from the War Illustrated, which I, I, I didn't uh, know about. And uh, this is another French publication. There are the French again, all in the September, October, 1918. And there's the article by Philip Gibb uh, that this is out of the New York Times, but it was all over the world. Then I, before going to France, I got pictures at the archives, which included these. These are from the National Library and Archives Canada. One, two, three, the, here they are loaded in a truck. There's another picture of them being loaded in a truck. And you notice there's a cinematographer. I don't know if that footage exists. I never found it. And this is another side view of them getting into the truck. And uh, there's another view. This is uh, with the obviously Canadian soldiers and uh, another one from Library and Archives Canada. This is the quarterly uh, publication of the Ecourt St. Quentin and Area Historical Society. It's very similar to the Maple Leaf really, and it's the same quality. Actually, I think it's all color, the whole thing. So I don't know where they get the money for that. But anyway, um, I can't show you Clemence Leroy's massive book because I can't find my copy of it. But it was just, the, the, I, I mentioned that the research happened so quickly while well, everything fell into place so quickly. So anyway, I had to go make a plan to go explore Arras. Where do you look for, where do you start? So I knew from the war diaries that they had been taken from Ecor. Somehow they were taken to a hospital in Arras. Now the hospital in Arras, Hôpital Saint Jean, is here. It was a British military hospital during the war. 
So that's what it looked like at the entrance uh, before the war, Hôpital Saint-Jean. Uh, this is in 1914-15. Uh, this is one of the buildings that had suffered uh, from the bombardment of Barras. This is another view of uh, another building in the hospital. This is a war during the war of men convalescing inside St. Saint, uh, John Hospital. Uh, this is another angle on the rue. I think it's the St. Aubert. It's the main artery that goes through Arras. That's the entrance to the hospital complex. Unfortunately, to my tough luck, it doesn't exist at all. Since 1945, it was torn down and completely redeveloped. And you can see it's a modern facade that's there. So that didn't look good for uh, trying to find where the video was taken or those photographs. This is uh, one of the buildings that was in the courtyard. This is the courtyard today. It's all modern 1960s vintage. And there's even two American style towers where the hospital was. So that was unfortunate. So there's the hospital. But what would be, we'll, we'll talk about it later. What will be important is the street next to it called Versoufle Street and the intersection of Versoufle and St. Morris. I, I'm gonna end up exploring there a little later. But there was also another problem. There were two hospitals in Arras. Over here at the Collège des Jeunes Filles, the uh, young girls college run by the Ursuline nuns, they had a big schools complex there. And that was where the walking wounded were treated by the British army during the war. So were they sent to walking wounded or were they sent to Saint-Jean? I guess maybe walking wounded because none of them were, were, uh, were bedridden. They were all mobile. But anyway, uh, this is what the uh, Collège des Jeunes Filles or the Ursuline College looked like before the war. You can see uh, the tower, the Ursuline Tower over here. Unfortunately, this has all been redeveloped since World War II. There's a modern college. Uh, everything has been torn down. This is a view of the entrance to the Ursuline College uh, uh, on the east side. This is on uh, Gambetta Street, which is the main artery in, uh, well, the, the main artery has three or four names in, in Arras. Um, you can see the Ursuline Tower survived the war because this photograph was from 1919, but they tore it all down uh, when they reconstructed and there's absolutely nothing left of the walking wounded uh, hospital, which was, I was starting to think, should I gamble two plane tickets on, is it worth it to go to Arras? Uh, but I went anyway. So this, I had to analyze the photos. This is a scan from the Illustration. Uh, I don't know where the originals of the, these photos are. These are scans from the publication. I've never found them anywhere else. Uh, these are obviously French civilians who are very happy about being liberated. Uh, this is a screenshot from the, um, the newsreel. And you'll notice the bricks are very similar. And if you look at the li uh, library and archives photograph, the bricks again are not the, obviously not the same building, but very similar masonry, um, that, that style. So that was a clue. So I went to Arras and this is a random derelict building in Arras and you can tell the masonry, I was hoping this was the right building, but it wasn't. But I found out there's a lot of buildings with this kind of brickwork. So here's another random building that survived the war that's still in Arras. And you can tell by the masonry, these are the same vintage construction, but obviously not the right building. So I kept walking around the city, basically, uh, just inspecting one building at a time. So here's another picture of uh, the Illustration with the civilians with some French officials in a what looks like a courtyard. Uh, Here's some more civilians uh, from L'Illustration, and this is from the newsreel, and you'll uh, see, recognize this photo from the Library and Archives Canada. The same, they, they have a different kind of brick. So that was another clue. So I was looking for buildings with that kind of brick. Here's one. This is a random building in Arras. 
Uh, it's not the right one, but of course, uh, it's the same vintage as the, the building uh, from the, the, the source pictures that I had. I had another clue here, which was important. Most guys here will recognize these men there. They said in the newsreel that they were British liberators. They were actually Canadian. And uh, these are fourth CMR, fourth Canadian mounted rifles. So they did not liberate the... Uh, the, the citizens of Ecor, but they intermingled with them. So I obviously I did what you guys would do. I looked in the war diary and uh, this is the museum in Arras. The fourth CMR, fourth Canadian Mounted Rifles were billeted here on September 4th, 1918. This is what the building looks like to today. It's been restored. And across the street, this building on Rue Tinturier was their headquarters. And they mention that there's a news camera taking pictures of civilians and they had a party with them. That's in the war diary. So there's the Hospital Saint-Jean. There's the museum. So it's very close to the Hospital Saint-Jean. This is the headquarters of the 4th CMR on Tinturier Street. So what I did, to, I'll just zoom it in for you. I went around the corner and I went down what was called Ver Souffle Street. And I'd been there in the morning and missed it. And uh, then I, uh, this is later during the day, I turned around the corner uh, like this. Basically I was in front of the headquarters and then I just went down the road and turned right. And there's Ver Souffle Street. Now this is a street that World War I, uh, uh, you know, Tourists don't go see. Uh, the left-hand side, uh, it's been heavily rebuilt since World War I and World War II, and it's very narrow and nobody goes here. But my ex, to bless her heart, she noticed it, so she won, she won the prize. She said, look at this building, that building down there. She saw it from uh, like uh, 400 yards away. So I'm just gonna zoom in on it. That's the same building on the right, it's white. Now look at this picture. And bang, that's where they were. At the corner, this is Ver Souffle at St. Morris. Now if we turn, the, this is the intersection right here. So they loaded the civilians in the trucks at that intersection. So all I did is turn right and look down St. Morris Street and look at the building I found. There's the, the, the side view or the rear, rear view of the truck. It's clearly the correct intersection. And this other picture confirms it even more. It's the same picture with a, a little different angle. Uh, they, they loaded the civilians up here, or, or maybe it looks like they're leaving by the, by the what's going on. And this is a, from an elevation. Uh, this is the intersection. This part, the, bu the building that I identified, the facade on the left is original to the 19th century. The right facade was rebuilt since World War II and with cheap uh, regular red brick. And if you notice, this building is new as well. So a lot of buildings on Ver Souffle Street were uh, damaged in World War II and rebuilt. Then I took out another picture. This is Ver Souffle Street, again, halfway down the street. And it was an exact match for this picture. So, and these are uh, fourth CMR and there we recognize the man all throughout. It's always the same soldiers. So all the pictures I had were taken roughly were the same day, I'm certain. This picture gave me a lot of trouble. They're, they're being uh, with fourth CMRs. They're standing on uh, what piles of rubble. Uh, I never identified where the picture was taken. I suspect it's Ver Souffle Street because all the uh, soldiers are recognizable. And uh, this street was a lot rebuilt. This is an example of a rebuilt uh, facade on uh, Ver Souffle Street. That picture could have been taken here, but I can't prove it. 
Maybe someday there'll be an archival photo of the ruins that will nail it down, but I, I got it really well. I got it pretty close, I should say. Now, when I got home, I don't know if Google Earth existed, but I had bought uh, satellite photos on CD of Aras, or, or, or I found it on Google Earth. I, uh, I went to uh, the, this is the, the corner of Ver Souffle at St. Morris Street where the trucks were. And I looked down, I said, hey, there's an inner courtyard here. So I sent my friend from Ecor St. Quentin and I said, can you go nose around in there and take some pictures? And this is what he saw. Now you might recognize this building from the newsreel. This is the inner courtyard. This building in 1918 was empty. It was a vacated orphanage. And today it's a high school. It's the St. Morris High School. And uh, I said, this has got to be the place. So I started matching up very carefully the photographs that I had. And this is exactly where that picture was taken that appeared in the Illustration. So they were very clearly taken to St. Jean Hospital. They were given a sanitary examination and they were for a very short time billeted in the orphanage. It's almost, uh, I've proved it almost conclusively. This picture exactly taken on this spot. And the newsreel was taken here. And I, I spent a lot of time matching up the pictures that I had hundreds of photos of these to match up till I got the right ones. I've since been to the courtyard to see it since I, I wrote a book about it and I, I wanted to see it for myself. But uh, it's, uh, it's really unbelievable uh, that, my, uh, that it paid off because the odds were against me. Oh, and uh, the, the, uh, this newsreel was taken in the corner. I didn't quite get this one lined up right, but it's in, it was definitely in the corner. And this is my favorite one with the fourth CMRs. So the, we, uh, we know part of the story now. So this is a photo from uh, in the 1890s. The little kid is sitting on what used to be ramparts of the, the Arras used to be surrounded by ramparts and they were, they were taken out in at the end of the 19th century. So this is looking south, you'll recognize the Belfry in Arras. This is the museum where the fourth uh, Canadian Mounted Rifles were billeted. And below you'll recognize Versoufle Street at St. Morris. And that's the street there. So anyway, a little history. In, uh, in October 1st, 1914, the, uh, during the race to the sea, the German army came up from the south uh, and then turned left on the Arras Cambrai Road. They captured Monchy le Preux, and then they pushed and fought against the D Barbeau Division and the Barbeau Division uh, the, fought valiantly and stopped uh, the Germans from capturing Arras. When that became a stalemate, they went north to a Vimy, captured Vimy, and then the fight, the fighting went on up until Ypres. So this is Ecor during the German occupation at the hot, at the church. And this is an interesting photo. I got this from the locals. Uh, these are local women from Ecor Saint Quentin that were conscripted to sweep the streets. And uh, the idea being if they were doing troop movements, the troops would kick up dust. So they would want to minimize that so that they were in slave labor effectively uh, to, to keep the streets clean. And this is Clemence Leroy, she's the school teacher. They've since renamed the local school in her honor. She wrote about the German occupation every single day I'm mean, like a paragraph to three paragraphs a day. It's an incredible look into the life of occupied France. And in my book, I use her memoir liberally. So it's the first time a memoir like this is available, any part of it in English, if you uh, read my book. So this is the front in 1917. So it stayed static uh, from... Uh, 
1914 to April 9, 1917. Then the British and Canadians attacked. The Canadians up north, you all know, took Vimy Ridge. The British took Monchy le Preux. And the, uh, after a month of fighting or so, the front stabilized on the Arras Cambrai Road in front of Monchy le Preux. Et Cour Saint Quentin was safely behind uh, the line still. March 1918, this is the front line in blue. The Germans launched their spring offensives. Uh, there's Arras, there's Et Cour Saint Quentin, and the Arras was kind of in a salient. Germans, uh, as you know, attacked uh, on the Somme. They attacked in uh, French Flanders. They attacked in uh, Soissons or Champagne or whatever you want to call it, the Chemin des Dames. And uh, they also tried to attack at Arras, uh, but failed. And by July 15th, 1915, this was the front line. So now I'm going to zoom in to Arras. What happened, this was the front line of uh, 1917. The Germans uh, ignored the Canadians on Vimy Ridge. They did not attack there for whatever reason. Uh, they did try to take uh, Arras, but the British, uh, the, the British uh, stopped them just short of tilouale Moflen, which is the first suburb before Arras. This was, uh, this was in, I think, March 28, 1918. So there's the front line. Then in July, July 18, the French and British attack in, uh, in the Ains, uh, first counterattack. Then the British Fifth Army or Fourth Army attack uh, at the Battle of Amiens uh, with the Australians and the, and the British. Now they always talk about this as a turning point. And, and because I'm a fan of the Arras Cambrai Road, I tend to play it down. Uh, the, the operation at Amiens was mainly to straighten out the front. You saw the big bulge that they had, and it, was, it, it, had, it, had, it had cut the, um, uh, they hadn't captured the Amiens uh, Paris Railroad, but they were too close to it, so they had to close down the railroads. So part of the Amiens offensive was to free up the, the lines of communication. Uh, they had been thrown in disarray in the spring offensives. And it, it ended up turning into a bigger victory than they planned, but it was uh, meant as a, as a straightening out of the uh, straightening of the line. And the French also attacked. They called the Battle of Amiens, the Battle of Amiens Montidier, and they took a big part in the fighting. And most people kind of overlook that. We always talk about the Australians and the, and the, and the Canadians, but the French were there too. And then uh, this was August the 8th. On August 21st to 23rd, the Third Army attacked toward Bapom because uh, what happened after the success of Amiens is uh, General Curry actually suggested to Haig that you stop the offensive at, at uh, Amiens and uh, to uh, disbalance the Germans is to widen the front. And the Canadian Corps was then selected on August 20th. There was uh, some pressure, uh, I'll, bring, I'll come back here. Uh, if you notice the arrow up in French Flanders on top, there was some pressure. I'm not sure how big the battle was, but uh, by August 26, this was the front line uh, of, uh, uh, so there, there still was, uh, the, there was still a, a considerable amount of land to capture. So on August 26, the Canadians were tasked from breaking the Drocourt Quiant line. So I hope this works. Uh, they were going to attack here at Arras. So they were moved from Amiens to Arras for the new offensive. And this was going to be almost, a, it was a little big for a surgical strike, but I call it almost a surgical strike against the Drocourt Quiant line. So this was the Hindenburg line uh, and the Drocourt Quiant line. Uh, connected uh, the Hindenburg line with the defenses at Lens and Flanders. So the Drocourt Quiant line in green was the hinge of uh, the German defensive system on the Western Front. And it had become uh, uh, necessary after the capture of Monchy-le-Preux and Vimy Ridge in 1917. And you can see how close 
uh, the, the German main defensive position was on the Arras front. So the Canadians had a lot to do with what happened on the Arras Cambrai Road. I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm the biggest booster of that. So if we zoom in, this is the front line, uh, the old front line from March 1918. Uh, the, the, the top arrow is the 51st Highland Division. They were flank protection north of the Scarp for the Canadian Corps. They were part of the Canadian Corps. They had no set objective. They were just there to exploit success and to protect the left flank. The two uh, bottom arrows are the two brigades of the second Canadian division that were attacking at Monchy le Peur. And down here was the second division attacking south of the Arras Cambrai Road. So it was a, an attack on a, on a relatively narrow front. Uh, there was also the British Third Army on the right of the second division was uh, conforming to the advance of the second division, but they clearly the main assault was from the two Canadian divisions. So a log story short, the Battle of the Scarp occurs and they, this is the front line on August 30, or the morning of September 1st, 1918. For the first time, in 1918, allies were on territory that had been held since 1914. The breakthrough happened here. Uh, so anyway, there's Dury. Dury was the next objective. Uh, Dury and of course St. Quentin. I just zoomed in on the front line of September 1st, 1918. There's the course St. Quentin. There's the Dury Ridge. There's Quillant in the south, and it's important because that's where the Drucourt Quillant line originated. Now, the Drucourt Quillant line was a very powerful uh, double trench system with a uh, support trench with plenty of concrete works. Uh, and it connected with the Hindenburg line at Quillant. And St. Servé Farm at Hocour, at the village of Hocour, is a landmark that we're going to use to, to get our bearings. It was actually captured by the 4th British Division on August 30th. Uh, they were under Canadian command. So for a short time, uh, for a short time, the 4th British Division was uh, part of the Canadian Corps. But that, that's another presentation. So this is uh, the Arras Cambrai Road looking towards Dury. That's the Dury Ridge. They see it's, I don't call it a mountain, it's more of a ridge. That's Dury Village in the distance. And that's saint Servain Farm, which is in front of the village of Hocour. This is the front line of the 4th Canadian Division that would be tasked to capture Dury and Dury Ridge on September 2nd, 1918. And look at the distance they had to go. It was about four kilometers uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to, to Dury. Oh, and for those who know the area, that's Dury Mill Cemetery. It's right on at the crest of the ridge. And there was a landmark all the soldiers knew here on the ridge called Dury Mill. It was a windmill. And this is an illicit photograph taken by a soldier after the battle. This is a, a soldier of the Canadian Grenadier Guards who took this picture. Uh, and it's now in the collection of the Grenadier Guards in Montreal. Uh, but that was a landmark that uh, that uh, all the soldiers knew. And this is just a stock photo from the uh, the Library and Archives Canada. It's supposedly the barbed wire belts of the Drucourt Quillant line. Although I couldn't tell you exactly where, except it looks like it's south of the Arras Cambrai Road. I'm just popping ahead in the future here. This is Dury Ridge. I just want to show. Uh, well, this is, we're looking, we're at, I'm at Dury looking towards Etang, which was just north of Dury on the Dury Ridge. And the concrete you see is leftovers from the Drucourt Quillant line. So there's still some vestiges there. So here we are, Dury, for a brigade of the 4th British Division attacked the Drucourt Quillant line north of Dury. Two brigades of the 4th Canadian Division attacked Dury and Dury Ridge. And south of the road, two brigades of the 4th of the 1st Canadian Division attacked 
um, towards Cagney Corps. On the right, I, I'm not showing it. I forgot to put a, an arrow in. There was the 57th Division who were meant to conform to the advance of the, uh, of the uh, 1st Canadian Division. So uh, by midday, this was the front line. The Canadians had broken through the Drocourt-Quiant line. The 4th Canadian Division had actually secured the village of Dury, but did not move past it. The Canadians south of the Drocourt-Quiant line uh, did better. They, uh, they captured the high ground beyond Cagney Corps, so they were in a salient. And then the a brigade of the 57th Division widened the front. They, they did not attack frontally. They attacked. They passed behind the 1st Canadian Division, did a strange maneuver, and rolled up uh, the, a, a section of the front from uh, going from uh, north, uh, north to south. What was interesting here is that the 1st Canadian Division was under Canadian Corps First Army. 57th Division had to coordinate with them, but they were uh, 17th British Corps, 3rd British Army. So it's amazing. They, there were a lot of uh, communication problems between the two of them. Uh, Cyrus Peck, the VC winner of the 16th Canadian Battalion, complained that the 57th didn't advance, but he didn't know that they had never planned to frontally assault. It was always planned they would they would pass through the gap by the Canadians and then uh, and roll up the front. After the 57th uh, did what they did, the 63rd Royal Naval Division, uh, two brigades passed through and then turn abruptly right to try and squeeze Kayant, but they uh, weren't able to take Kayant. And then the 52nd Lowland Division pushed against Kayant as well, but Kayant would not be captured until September 3rd. So uh, that's the 52nd Division. So the front line on the morning of September 3rd, 1918 looked like this. Now the Germans had a problem. They were outflanked on Mount Dury. And uh, let me see, uh, what they had to do is uh, choose whether to stay and fight or uh, lose all their guns. So they withdrew all their guns behind the Canal du Nord in blue. And the front line uh, eventually became the Canal du Nord. Uh, the circle is the, the Sanse Marshes, just north of Vicor St. Quentin. And the other blue line is the Tranquise Brook. And that would be the front line for three weeks. So at this section of the front, the Western Front did not go north-south, it went east-west. And I, I point out here on the Canal du Nord, the Marc Wion Bridge, it's on the Arras-Cambrai Road. That was actually the Canadian objective. They wanted to do a bridgehead across the Canal du Nord and they failed. They were supposed to send uh, Canadian and British armored cars down the Arras-Cambrai Road to secure it, uh, but, uh, it was a bridge too far, they failed. But I can't, I can't name any of my books a bridge too far, although I'd like to, because the name is already taken. So this is the uh, Marc Wion Bridge. Uh, this is an armored car of the 17th, car, uh, 17th, uh, uh, 17th uh, Tank Battalion, British Tank Battalion, which was under the command of Raymond Brutnell, the Canadian. And uh, the, these are the Canadian armored cars. There were six of them at the time that tried to speed down the road, but it was too late. The Germans had blown up the bridge. Sorry, this is a uh, blurry picture, but this is the bridge. Uh, uh, the Germans uh, destroyed it. So the, the, the Canadians actually failed in their main objective. They wanted to actually secure the, the bridgehead at the Canal du Nord. They didn't. And like Norm Christie said, it could have gone either way. Uh, the Canadians were on Mount Dury, staring at the Canadians. And like Norm Christie said, the Germans blinked and they chose to withdraw. So here we are back at Hokor on the front line. The, this is just to show you where the 4th Canadian Division advanced. Now, this is the road uh, just at the base of Mount, uh, the Dury Ridge. That's where the, um, 
the, the mill was at the time. This is Dury Village. And that's the second line of the Drocourt Puyant line. And uh, a brigade of the fourth division attract in these fields here. Now this is me just turning right a bit. It's the same road, it's the same Dury Ridge. There's the Dury Memorial for those of you who know it. It's on the IRS Cambrai Road. There's Dury Mill Cemetery at the top of the ridge. There's the second main line of the Grocourt Quiant line and the other brigade of the uh, 4th Canadian Division attacked here. So this is me turning around looking from where we came towards the Canadian front line. That water tower you see there is right next to St. Servain Farm. It was the jump off spot of the 4th Division. There's Hocour. This was also a jump off spot from uh, of another brigade of the 4th Division. And uh, this is the main line of the uh, Drocourt Quiant line. So the, the two trenches are sandwiched between, the road is sandwiched between the two trenches. And the 4th uh, Canadian Division attacked over these fields a distance of four kilometers. Now, uh, what one they they did capture the reserve line and then parallel to the Drocourt Quiant line on the ridge was a sunken road right here that you can see this uh, this was a bloodbath this is where the fourth division suffered all its casualties the Germans manned machine guns here and uh, through uh, 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 because they kept committing all their reserve battalions until they finally cracked the nut and captured this uh this road and you'll see in the distance that's dury mill and i asked tim cook i said was it a mistake uh to keep committing because they the fourth canadian division is it's unusual every single battalion was committed to the fighting that day so um they suffered horrendous casualties and uh it it uh, uh, well, I an army friend of mine said no. It was shit happened. They had to break it, and they did. They threw everything they had to do it. So this is the sunken road today, and you can see Dury. Whoops, Dury the Dury water tower on the horizon. So you're right on the ridge here, and this is uh, the Dury Ridge. Uh, my friend Jean Marie Des of Eterpingi in France near. He lives near Dury. He's a, he knows more about fortifications than I do. He says this is a, a German machine gun post on Dury Ridge. And you can see uh, the Dury Memorial and uh, the Dury Mill Cemetery there. And that's the support line of the Drucourt Quiant line. Is that a Commonwealth uh, yeah. cemetery? Okay. Yeah, it is fourth division exclusively. Okay. Fourth Canadian division, all the dead are September 2nd, 3rd, 1918. It's, a, it's a, like if uh, it, it, this is a trench map of the area. Uh, uh, this is the front line trench of the Drucourt Quiant line. There was actually another double system on the left. That's not at the, there was actually four trenches for a, a section of the front. This is the second line of the Drucourt Quiant line. This is where Dury Mill was. This is Dury. That's the road I was standing on about where I took the pictures. So um, they got to the, uh, basically they got here. They got to the sunken road and uh, they couldn't move any farther. Now this is the view from Dury Mill looking towards the Canal du Nord. Uh, that's, I remember I talked to you about a high point called Mount Robin. That's Mount Robin. That's the next high point after the Dury, uh, the Dury Ridge. This is the Mar the bridge at Marquio. We can see there's grain elevators uh, by the canal there at Marquio where the bridge is. You see how much farther they still had to go. It had been very ambitious. Uh, they were very ambitious to think they could get that far in one day. And that's the route taken by the arm, should have been taken by the armored cars, but they failed. 
This is Dury after the war. Uh, the 46th Battalion of the 4th Canadian Division actually entered Dury Village uh, in the morning at about 8 o'clock on uh, uh, September 2nd, 1918. This is what Dury looks like today. And uh, this magnificent, I guess it's a pigeon coop, uh, survived the war. So there's very few buildings that have survived under the Pourquoi outline. So I just pointed out, you can go see it for yourself. This is the view of Dury Ridge from Mount Robin. These are the German positions when they were peppering the Canadians who were fighting for their lives on the Dury Ridge. Uh, that's the Dury Memorial on the left. Uh, that's the village of Dury on the right. That's Dury Mill where it would have been. It's obviously gone. And that clump of trees is Dury Mill Cemetery. So that's, uh, that's that. Now, oh, and this is uh, the Valley of the Hirondelle. It's important, it's the Hirondelle Stream. We're gonna talk about the Hirondelle Stream uh, or Creek a little later. So now we're in Acor St. Quentin uh, while this is all going on. Uh, the front line on September 3rd is here. And the Germans decide to evacuate the, uh, all the population with their evacuating but uh, 40 or so civilians decide to stay in a course in Quentin. Oh, and there's Dury, just in case you forgot where it was. And Dury Mill Cemetery, uh, in case you forgot where it was. And that's Mount Robin, which is, uh, I'm gonna talk about again a little later. And that's the Marco Bridge to, to, I'm trying to keep you situated here. And that's the Irondelle Stream. So the Germans, like I said, decide blink. So they decided to evacuate the area. They went behind the Canal du Nord in a hurry. And this is the uh, new front line. So that's the front line. They broke through the Drocourt Quiant line here. The Australians on, uh, to a lesser degree, the Australians uh, had an impact uh, by capturing Mount, Mount uh, St. Quentin at uh, Peron on September 1st. That forced the German 17th Army, the entire army chose to evacuate from the Arras front, and then two more German armies uh, in successive days therefore had their flanks exposed, had to withdraw, so like dominoes they started to withdraw. And the withdrawal went down all the way to La Faire at the base of the Hindenburg line. And I believe it even impacted the re retirement to the Chemin des Dames. So the breaking of the drocourt quiant line, in my opinion, it was a tremendous strategic victory uh, for the number of units engaged, the results that it, uh, that it gave makes it one of the most uh, strategically uh, consequential Canadian battles of the 20th century. So now I'm in, uh, I'm, in, I'm gonna tell the story of the civilians there in Ecourt. Uh, they decide to, uh, Ernest, Ernest Lechevin, who was a town councillor, had a farm complex in town called the Lechevin Farm or the Abbey. It was solidly built. So he invited his, uh, the civilians that refused to be evacuated to go hide there because they were bombarding the hell out of this place. Uh, there's the Irondelle stream, which is important. And uh, this is the entrance. This is Cemetery Street. The cemetery is on the right. This is the, the farm complex that belonged to Mr. Le Chauvin. This is him. Uh, he wrote a book after the war, which I was able to use parts of and translate. And this is the Abbey from the behind. And this is from the front and uh, it's a tenement uh, building, but I was lucky again, very serendipitously, uh, I was able to go visit some of the cellars where they actually hid. And you can see why they chose this place uh, to hide from the bombardment. So the 45 civilians were hidden here. That's a fact. And this is another, it's, it was in, there were three uh, rooms in this cellar and the tall fellow on the left is my publisher. He came down to, while I was doing research to uh, check up on my book, 
And the fellow on the, on the right is my ally in Ecor St. Quentin. He's the, uh, uh, um, he's the Glen of, uh, of the uh, historical society over there. Very respected position. <laughs> yep. So here's Ecor St. Quentin on an IGN map. That's where Le Chavet Farm was, or the Abbey. That's the Iron del Stream. This is the culvert on the road to Rumacor, which is important. Now, there were two civilians that didn't want to go into the Le Chavet Farm. It was Mr. Burry and his daughter, Emilienne. And they were staying in 26 Rue du Préau. And they stayed there during the bombardment and, as it turns out, to greet the Canadians when they came in. And this is 26 Du uh, in the 1920s, uh, the day they inaugurated their war memorial. The, so the local historical society dressed up as uh, medieval uh, archers and stuff. And Rue Du Préau, Mr. Boiry's house is exactly here. And that's gonna be important a little later. So there's Dury, there's the front line. On September 3rd, 1918, they were supposed to attack again at 5 a.m. and uh, General Curry probably wisely decided to cancel the attack at the last minute. Uh, they had taken too many losses, particularly on Mont Dury. Uh, but then in the morning, uh, a pilot of number five squadron RAF flew over the battlefield at 100 feet and quickly reported that the Germans were gone. So then in the course of the morning, uh, orders were received that they were to push out patrols and exploit as far as they could go. So the British 4th Division entered Etain in the north. The 44th Canadian Battalion went captured Raycourt. The 46th Battalion count, count, captured Sand Hill or Mont La Sablière. The 87th Canadian Grenadier Guards uh, got to Sodomo over here. Now, this is the entrance to Sodomo, the way the 87th Battalion would have advanced. You see, this is post-war and the church has survived. This is what the area looks like today. There's a lot of trees, so you can't see the church. There's the church, uh, I think during or before the war. What's interesting about it is it's from the 12th century and it's the only surviving medieval church anywhere in the area because everything was destroyed and uh, hopefully in April, COVID permitting, uh, the historical society is gonna take me to see it. I've never been in it, but it's from the 12th century. We can't imagine the buildings that old here and they can't either. Everything they live in is built in the twenties <laughs> because of the war. So there's the 87th battalion. They exploited past Sodomo. Unfortunately, they were hit by shelling and uh, an officer was killed. Uh, this is the field, that's Sodomo Church. This is the field between Ecor St. Quentin and Sodomo. Uh, the 87th uh, advanced uh, this way and uh, an officer was killed. It was Lieutenant Albert Lloyd of the 87th Battalion from Montreal. He's buried in Quebec Cemetery in Cherisy. But they did get into Ecor St. Quentin. Now, in the meantime, the civilians, I learned this from Mr. Lichervain's book, they kept sending out people to go check on the bombardment. Is it clear to come out yet? And they kept popping up. And there were uh, some Germans before leaving said, uh, you're going to get killed if you stay here. And finally, the 87th Battalion entered the village and to their great delight, they were able to, to understand some of them. Uh, the 87th Battalion had a probably 25% French speakers. And uh, they, Mr. Lechevin records that, that the, the liberating troops, uh, they could understand. So uh, had it been another battalion like the 46th, uh, the, the, it wouldn't have happened, but that's, that's that. So there's the Corps St. Quentin. This is what the 87th found. This is the main road, a picture taken just after the war. The, 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 uh, the building was heavily shelled. This is what it looks like uh, today. 
it's uh, been, all been uh, obviously restored. It's the same spot. Uh, this was the Mary in school. It was uh, heavily damaged, but salvaged. This is what it looks like today. And uh, they found these civilians in uh, Le Chauvin Farm. Probably on September 4th, uh, the, there was in gunfire, it's a, a memoir, uh, a memoir. Uh, they mentioned that they, or, or the war diary of an artillery, a Canadian artillery battery said they wanted to use the church as an observation post, but the Germans started shelling it and the church lost uh, the top of the steeple. But we know for a fact it didn't happen during the main battle. It was shelled uh, around September 3rd or September 4th. The, the sources vary. So this is the church uh, after the war. And it's, it's still there. It's been restored to its former glory. They did lose the bell. The bell was commandeered during the war. Uh, the metal was melted down for the German war effort. So they actually christened a new uh, bell in the 1920s. So it's, I have pictures of it. And it's they made a christening gown for the bell. It's, it's really quite interesting. It's a tradition in France that, you, that they, they christen they, like a, 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 a Catholic christening of the bell. I should have put a picture of that, but anyway. Uh, so this is the field just south of uh, the Lichavet farmer, the Abbey. Three young men uh, decided not to wait in the Abbey. They decided to run into the barrage to meet the, Canadian, the liberator. They didn't know they were Canadians yet. And this I learned from family lore that they, they uh, got to the edge of Rubocor. Uh, well, this is the field. Uh, that's Le Chauvet Farm right there, the Abbey. And you recognize the church. They went across this field here and reached the edge of Rubocor. This is the, just the, the signboard of Rubocor and there's a culvert. And this is the Irodel stream. And from family members, we know that they followed, they did not go through Rumacor. They went to the north of Rumacor at the base uh, through the Hirondel Valley. So basically they went this way. There's the culvert. And they, they didn't go down the main road of Rumacor. And then they, the 54th Battalion, uh, 4th Division, was going this way and they intercepted them. But what happened was, is the three of them, one of them must have gotten scared, one hid in the culvert and only two met the 54th Battalion, right here. <clears throat> and it's really incredible. We know uh, the two uh, Frenchmen came this way, the Rumacor's on the left, the 54th Battalion came this way, and uh, they were intercepted by a platoon of the 54th. And miraculously, I know who the commander was. It was Lieutenant Bernard to William Tobias of the 54th Battalion. It's in the war diary. And this explains this picture. This is in the front line. They're with soldiers, probably Canadians, probably on the Arras Cambrai Road. There's two civilians here. So the story checks out that they intercepted two. And there's another picture of them. They look happy. And you notice uh, they've got German gas, uh, gas mask containers. And uh, we, I found out that one of them was called Gustave Barbier and Noël Lagrange. And more miraculously, they had kids and their daughter and son got married in 1945 and I got to meet them, uh, Charles Barbier, and Der Lagrange, and Der just died last week. She was 100. And uh, normally oral history, I, in my opinion, is always wrong. What the story that they were told by their fathers about the Hirondelle stream and one fella hiding and only two of them being picked up by the Canadians, all checks out. And in their bedroom, hanging there since 1945, was uh, the, uh, the military photo that I just showed you from the, the, the Library and Archives Canada. And, I, and the hairs stood up on, my, on the back of my neck when I saw that. 
that this story was still alive somewhere in France. So this is uh, this is the my my copy of the Library and Archives photo. Uh, I, I I don't know what happened to that photo now that the couple's passed on. I hope it's passed down to the family. And there they are. These are the three uh, that left the uh, the uh, Abbey on September third, nineteen eighteen. Uh, there they are with the fourth uh, Canadian Mounted Rifles at the orphanage. And you can pick them out. There's uh, Gust uh, Noël Lagrange, Gustave Barbier. And the third one was Léonce Doissy right here. Léonce Doissy. So we actually put it names to all of these guys. I never found the family of Léonce Doissy. So that was the front line on the morning of September 3rd. The first division advanced in the south. Uh, the fourth division advanced towards the Canal du Nord. The, uh, that little arrow is the 87th Battalion. They didn't stay very long in Ecor. They were very busy. They pushed out to push the line as far as they could. So their contact was relatively short lived with the uh, the civilians. But the 46th Battalion, um, the 46th Battalion, uh, the, the 87th was soon pulled out of the line and the 46th widened their front and became responsible for Ecor St. Quentin. So um, the 46th Battalion War Diaries where we find all the interactions with the civilians. And that was the front line on the night of um, September 4th, 1918. And that front line stayed there. Uh, basically, this was a sharp angle on the Western Front. The, that, that front line went all the way back to Arras. So the, like I said before, the front line of the Western Front ran east-west until uh, September 27, 1918, when they attacked the Canal du Nord which is a whole other presentation. Now there was this village called Paluel at the end of a, a Nassance marshes. Uh, uh, there was a causeway leading to this village, Paluel. And there was a soldier of the 46th Battalion, George Kentner. And I use his uh, unpublished diary in the book. Um, so if you wanna read my book, there's more stuff in it than in the presentation. Uh, he was ordered, well, they had, to, they had to widen the front to be responsible for Ecor St. Quentin where they met the civilians, but George was given a special mission. His section was sent to capture Paluel and he was really upset about it. So uh, he, they thought it was just a, a there for ripe for the picking. So this is the IGN map. The 46th Battalion, before they widened the front, were uh, holding uh, the front in this field. That's where George Kentner was. Then there's Paluel. If you didn't see it, there's Paluel. George went down uh, Dupreho Street, where Mr. Burry lives, and uh, made it to the causeway. And Paluel was fortif uh, heavily uh, fortified by the Germans. Uh, they he was mad, they lost some casualties and he could not go past uh, the causeway. But on the way, there's the causeway. On the way, he says that he saw a man with his daughter in front of his house uh, while he walked by. And it has to be Mr. Burry and uh, his daughter Emilienne. So it was just amazing all the connections I was able to make through sheer luck. Because I remember Kentner's memoir is unpublished. I got a copy from the, his daughter who was 90 something and uh, was able to use it. And it, I was hoping Norm Christie would publish it someday. So this is the causeway today. You can see uh, the marshes on the right. Uh, this is as far as poor George Kentner got. This was the front line until September 27, 1918. I believe Paluel was captured on the 27th or 28th of September by the 56th London Division. But that's another presentation. So there's Ecor. 
We know from eyewitness accounts that the civilians were evacuated from Ecor and they went southwest uh, from Ecor back towards Arras. And they came across some artillerymen in a sand pit uh, just south of Dury. And the witness uh, was another artilleryman, uh, her, uh, incidentally, uh, who was on Mount Robin and he could see them. This is the view on Mount Robin. And in, on the horizon, he saw the French civilians leaving. Uh, and uh, this is the sand pit. And the artillerymen who were in the sand pit in the war diary mentioned uh, that the civilians had passed through their position. So we know for a fact this is the route they took. Then they met at more artillerymen on the Arras Cambrai Road at about this spot here. And uh, this is what it looks like today. This is uh, the, the civilians came down the road on the right. There's Dury Mill in the distance and Dury. So it's the same, uh, same to, uh, try to keep you situated. And then uh, they, were treat they were looked after by a field ambulance at Hopur over here. Uh, that's a fact, uh, right at this spot. Uh, and then Livesay says that they came by the Canadian Corps uh, headquarters. And Livesay reports that a young girl kissed left uh, General Morrison here. He was head of the Canadian Corps artillery. She, they, she kissed him on both cheeks and said, you are our saviors. So good for him. And then the civilians were taken, as I've already proved, to the orphanage. Uh, they were likely checked up at the uh, St. Uh, Jean, uh, Jean Hospital, the military hospital. They were billeted for a short time at the orphanage that you see here. They were then loaded on the trucks. And according to uh, what the locals think is that they were actually sent right back to Ecor St. Quentin. There was probably nowhere else to put them. So they went back to their homes. The village was empty, but uh, that's, that's it. Now on November 11, 2010, my book came out. That's me when I was, uh, I weighed less. And uh, the fellow, the French soldier on the right is Jean-Marie Dez, who's one of my allies in France. Uh, he was responsible for renaming the traffic circle on the IRS Cambrai Road at Dury, uh, the, the seven VC traffic circles. And there's now seven maples buried there, for uh, not buried, they're planted there. And there's big signs all the way around uh, uh, commemorating the seven Victoria Crosses that were awarded on September 2nd, 1918. He also was uh, instrumental in getting the James Young VC and, um, and Bellenden Seymour Hutchison VC plaques set up in Dury as well. And he, I just found out he's being awarded the Meritorious Service Medal by the Governor General. So that's really uh, pretty special. And I had nothing to do with the 7 VC uh, the traffic circle that was exclusively his project. Although I probably contributed indirectly because of all the times I've gone there, because I've been 15 times to talk about uh, the 7 VC. So I may have had an, an, a spiritual influence, but uh, it, was, it was all his doing, all the legwork. It was something getting the uh, roads and bridges to approve a name change of something like a traffic circle. Putting up plaques is easy, uh, but renaming highways and renaming traffic circles is harder. And on uh, November 11, 2010, uh, this was the ceremony in Ecor St. Quentin. Uh, you see all the standard flag bearers that you see uh, normally at these things. Uh, there's the war memorial, and they commemorated a plaque to the memory of Lieutenant Albert Lloyd, officer of the 87th Battalion, killed at, at Ecor St. Quentin, 3 September 1918, age 24, while during the combats for the liberation of the village. And I think he's the, actually the only soldier to die. And it was nice that they did that. Now, I, I collected um, dozens of completely unrelated uh, sources uh, from Canada, the UK, and France. And 
I think I've got the story almost right. So that's it for me. Uh, Michelle, I often say, um, we've had some remarkable presentations over the years, and I often say it's as good as it gets, but I can sincerely say the quality of your research and presentation is as good as it gets. So we, on behalf of the uh, Central Ontario branch of the Western Front Association, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for sharing a, life, a lifetime of remarkable research with us. So thank you so much for that. Well, thanks. Uh, can I jump uh, in for a minute? Sorry. Uh, first of all, I just want to say it's an amazing presentation. And what's interesting is that 735 soldiers from the 60th Battalion, when they were disbanded at the end of April, after the Battle of Bimmy Ridge, actually ended up with the 87th Battalion. And your Lieutenant Albert Lloyd actually originally was an officer in the 60th Battalion. Well, I, 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 I think I knew that at one time. I don't, I didn't, I, I didn't really yeah. remember. I did what I found for... what I found very interesting was because I've always thought about my grandfather served with the 60th and when the battalion was disbanded at the end of April of 1917, I always thought about because all most of the soldiers went to the 87th battalion. I was thinking about writing sort of a sequel of picking up of all those soldiers that carried on to the end of the war and you sort of filled in some gaps for me. Oh, well, that's good. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, well, I'll open the floor to questions. I think we can manage it without um, putting our hands up and uh, uh, using the chat feature. If you have a question, we'll try and sneak in there. A question. <laughs> um, I looked at your website uh, quickly and the book looks impressive. Um, I understand the problem with the publisher. Have you ever tried, thought of or are you capable of doing a publish on demand? That if uh, somebody was willing to buy um, a copy that you can print off a, a, a copy like Serlox bound or whatever. Well, I, I thought about it, but I, I, I finished four manuscripts this winter uh -huh. uh, and I'm having volume. It's a four volume history of the RS Cambrai road in French. And uh -huh. that, and then now I'm working on a, on I'm finished those and there hopefully one volume will appear every year until 2025. <clears throat> and I'm doing a, a, a book on the uh, St. Julian Garrison in 1915, which is completely out of my wheelhouse. So my mind is on, my spare time is on that project. So I've done the website. I'm going to keep it up for a year. If anybody wants to read it, uh, it's there. Um, and uh, the, I, I thought of print on demand, but I'm not going to bother. Yeah. What about even digital copy so that somebody, uh, you know, and, purchase a digital copy so that we you can review it at um if it's that was and one of my it, concerns what happens if the website disappears yeah yeah uh i'll think about it <laughs> yeah if you do if you decide to let us know i, I would be interested michelle i know a little shop uh, that just opened up where we could uh sell it for you yeah <laughs> yeah sure yeah, you, you're uh, the the associate the group uh, could do it for sure. Uh, just even a PDF. Yeah, might be more practical than reading a website, but uh, anyway. Yeah. So anyway, that's it. Very that's all I know about the civilians in Ecor. <laughs> but Michelle, are your other four books going to be printed by a publisher somewhere? Or the yeah, Ezekiel Dion out of Normandy. Okay, great. Yeah, the, the, I, I've published three with them already. Uh -huh. you no, know, my my tough as nails, I translated into, into French. In 2008, it came out. It's still in print, and I've sold 1,800 copies. That's excellent. Yeah. Very good. So the uh, the one on Ecor, uh, I only sold about 500. So it was it's actually on the verge of being a commercial failure. Uh, and the, yeah. the publisher told me we chose the name wrong. Uh, it, that people think it's just a local history when it really does have a broader appeal. But uh, sure. but uh, anyway. Oh, yeah. uh, but do read if you if you're interested in the story. There's a lot in the the presentation is about my research on the story, 
the book is about the story. So I, you get to George Kentner's point of view and Clémence Leroy, and, uh, and there's things in the book that's not in the presentation. So uh, I should correct that with the website or something. I, I should, uh, well, at least I know this presentation will live on on the website here. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, anyway. Well done. Is, is Michelle's the book available uh, anywhere? Which one? The the uh, the one you were just talking about, the five hundred. My website. One. You have to if you want to read it. The full the the full book is on is ecor nineteen eighteen Tough as nails is available in print. Oh uh, no, it's uh, 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 a fan of mine bought the last copy on AB Books. I think. Uh, oh wow! Ask Norm to reprint it. Okay. Yeah. I said I was uh, I was the I read it in one day. I couldn't put it down. It was a well, it, it's only about 40,000 words, but uh, oh, none of the, the, the volume one of my history is my longest book that's coming out in, uh, in April. It's 120,000. Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, my limit. It, it was actually 200,000. Uh, then I realized the book, it, there's half of it is pictures. So the book was going to be too big. Yeah. So I ended up breaking it down into three. And then finally I had enough material for four volumes. So there's total 500 pages in Word that I wrote in wow. four months. But I had done 20 years of research and I had all the primary sources at home and I have a thousand book World War I library at home with all the wow. German sources and the, uh, and the French sources included. So that what's interesting about my French books coming out is I, I've gotten trans, I bought every, I have the, every German regimental history that was at the drucourt quiant line. I've bought, I have about 20 or 22, uh, 22 of them. And I've had the chapters translated. So uh, the war diaries don't exist, except for maybe the Bavarian ones. So this is as close as we're gonna get. And, and no World War I historian, because uh, I, I talked to an elderly man that worked on the, with Nicholson on the book. Uh, they used some German sources and they got them in England. Uh, the War Museum has no copies of, they have no German sources at the War Museum. So it, it's too bad if you, if you can speak French, you'll have access to, to that. It's a shame I don't have an English language publisher, uh, but uh, maybe if somebody uh, sees this video, they'll solicit me and, uh, and do it someday. Did, have you ever contacted Hellion in England? You okay? Yeah, I did. It's a really complicated process. I don't remember if I got a rejection from them or not. Okay. Some are more That's... casual for uh, how you apply. Some of them, it's a lot of work. Uh, yeah, because Hel yeah, Hellion published my book. First, they rejected me, and then the guy had second thoughts, and then he ended up publishing. Oh, the, well, congratulations. Because uh, yeah. I, I, I know of it. Yeah. 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 Um, Michelle, I just wanted to say, uh, I thought your detective work regarding the photographs in and around Arras was incredible. Yeah. I've got a very, very keen interest in that sort of thing. And, uh, um, I also want to say that, you know, you said that there was a lot of serendipitous, um, circumstances and a lot of luck. Well, there's no luck without hard work. Yeah. Um, and you definitely put the work in and I think luck comes to those people to be perfectly frank. And I, we've all been in that situation where you're standing in the battlefield and there's a eureka moment. Oh my God, I'm actually here. But you're here because you've done the homework and you got yourself in the right spot. Yeah. So congratulations on that. And I'm very, very curious as to uh, who do you think shot the motion picture footage that you no. have? Um, because, the, because the cinematographers and pho photographers went in gangs together uh, that's why some of the photographs are very similar to some of the motion picture uh, footage. Uh, so I'm kind of curious. The one cinematographer looks a lot like Jeffrey Malins, who was attached to the Canadians quite often and actually was commissioned in the Canadian Well, Army. if you can identify him, I'll modify my presentation. And uh, that, that's something new I didn't know. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the photographs of anything Archives Canada, that was um, almost everything from uh, late 17 on, was shot by William Ryder Ryder. Um, so uh, he was the cinema, he was the photographer attached to the Canadian Corps. 
uh, for the last hundred days and much, much prior well, to that. There's a series of pictures that were taken in 1919, I noticed. There's wartime ones. And then shortly after the armistice, there's a set. I don't know if it's the same photographer. Um, it was a different fellow. Um, Ryder, Ryder stuck around for a while, but it was a different, a different number of uh, photographers. But uh, again, I can't tell you how much uh, I uh, was absolutely gobsmacked with some of the uh, matching that you were able to do. Um, and I'm very jealous. <laughs> well, uh, Michelle, his, what? No, Michelle, sorry, Rod Henderson is still with us, I think. He did an article for the Maple Leaf, uh, the cover story called Shooting the War, and he named a lot of the uh, uh, staff the photographic staff, so maybe he uh, might have some information for you. Don't want to put you on the spot there, Rod, but... Uh... Well, I, I wondered about the the photographer might have been... I know the, the 1919 battlefield pictures must have been Canadian commissioned because it's for, it's of Canadian battlefields. Yeah. Uh, the cinematographer, the, they said it was British liberators. Had it been a Canadian crew... Did they just say British generically? Because it's technically true. Mm -hmm. uh, had it been Canadian, would would it have said Canadian? Or did uh, Pathé or whoever the news agency was felt it had a broader appeal or the soldiers looked too much like British soldiers? I don't know. No, well, lots of references were to Imperial or British or Canadians were just considered uh, British forces in a lot of places. Yeah. And they look like them, right? Well, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were still a dominion back then. So we were, yeah. you know, we were imperial citizens. Yeah. So anyway, thank you for paying attention. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad I did it again. I, I, I told no to Glenn. I said I did it before, but then I thought, you know what, uh, this is probably, it's actually this, because I, this is, this is some of my best work and I don't mind sharing it again. Uh, this is the one with the most, uh, the most independent sources to it to piece together step by step. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, finding out like why, like why were there two soldiers in the trenches and uh, 30, 40 soldiers, uh, uh, two, two civilians in the trenches and why were they showing up in a newsreel and why were there 45 people uh, here? How, how did all that get put together? It's really, it, got, it was very serendipitous. I was unusually uh uh lucky in the, and then the french people uh were were just talking about that event after a hundred years after 90 years at the time yeah. it, it just came out in 2008 yeah. uh and then i was lucky to connect these these societies are important because you'll have an outsider like me come into the historical society and say can you help me and they know a little small piece of the story they're glad because you're bringing them the whole rest of the story, but that's what they're that's what they're there for. Is uh, so I, I expect sometimes you get people who are mildly interested, maybe not interested in World War One per se, but want to know about their grandfather's battalion, and then they go to the historical society to a guy like Glenn, or can you put me on to somebody who knows somebody something about the 60th battalion? Now I know I didn't know that the, the now I know who's the who knows the 60th battalion. I didn't remember that Lloyd was originally a 60th battalion, yeah. but he He's was still... from Montreal. And by the way, his son died in the 80s. So I was never able to get a, a better picture than the news clipping. And he only had one son. Mm. And uh, it's amazing uh, a casualty that had kids. Most casual most casualties are great uncles of relatives. Yeah. Uh, he had a son, but the son, unfortunately, I tracked him down. I'm good at uh, mm. reverse genealogy, but right, uh, that's what I yeah. do too. Yeah, but anyway, <laughs> I, so I, I just I just have one very serious question here. How do you get permission to go over there 15 times? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm still working on getting my permission to go one time. Well, uh, I need more money then, and uh, my wife fell in love with a RAS. So don't kid yourself. I would go on a seven day trip. And it'd be one and a half days of battlefield research, and the rest was pretty much shoe shoe shops uh, and the, e eating dinner. And and the problem with speaking French and making friends there is they take you to dinner. I, I remember I went with Brigadier General Young. We went to a uh, Cagney Corps, a uh, Henda Corps, for uh, we were working on the uh, the Crow's Nest Memorial, and uh, I 
I, my friend from Cagney Corps came out to help us and he invited us to lunch. So I said, Greg, uh, whatever you want to see, you better see it before lunch. And he said, why? We can just come back out. I said, no, we went to lunch late at one. He went to see everything because we sat down at one and we finished lunch at five. So the sun had set. It was in the way it was in the in the fall. And he never had eaten a meal like that in his life. He said it with the pauses exactly like I'm saying. We ate for four hours. Uh, so what I'm saying is you it, it be, it's a curse speaking French because then you you get a victim of the hospitality. So uh, like I'm going in April, I have to dedicate because uh, I I've never gone back to Ecor since 2008. I went there twice. Well, I've been there a bunch of times, but twice to do research. And uh, I have to go spend the day with my friend there because uh, it's he, I owe him a lot. And I, I, I'm, I'm always pulled. I, I'm well known on the RS Cambrai Road, so I, I, I get pulled in every direction. But I, I slotted a day and we're doing non-World War I stuff because he's not a World War I guy. He's a local history guy. So I said, well, then I'd like to go see that medieval church. Uh, and then he'll, oh my God, I'll make arrangements and you can go up the belfry and, uh, that'll, that, and then the rest of the time we'll be eating and, you know, so. Hey, Michelle, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. I, I just found out that uh, looking at my book that, uh, Lieutenant, uh, Albert Lloyd actually had seven brothers who were fought in World War One. Oh, so and there one, must be and one of them was, uh, one was with them in the 60th Battalion when was killed actually, George. So there's so descendants there's around. Yeah, there's seven brothers. I didn't know that. I, yeah. I really didn't know that. I, I reversed. I found out. Uh, I got 220 photos from my book by sending two and a half thousand emails out to people <laughs> through Ancestry. Oh, really? And, and so I knew the birth and the name of the person where they were born. You might want to try that for Lloyd to get a better picture, maybe. Anyways, right. Whatever. If I could interject, am I on? Yep. Yeah, I just want to thank you, sir, for your time. Uh, one foot in front of the other stomping around in uh, France. They're putting all this together. I, I admire your fluidity, uh, your ability to speak and present this package, uh, this presentation today. I'm, I'm hoping that somebody pushed record and yes. Yes. it would be uh, submitted to uh, uh, the National Archive somewheres for future people to uh, check up on it. I, I really felt uh, transported there. I, I felt that I was standing beside you and uh, the matching of the buildings, like what a jigsaw puzzle you must have been able to try to sort out. That's just amazing that people have the, the courage, the ability and the might to do that. Um, yeah, it's guys like you that help uh, educate me uh, just a peasant from Saskatchewan, <laughs> but uh, I really learned a lot today, and I just want to thank you for that. I got to step away now, so uh, I just want to thank you and uh, for your time in putting this together, and I learned a lot, and uh, your technical ability to uh, put things together was a well-put-together presentation, just like watching a movie. Great. So, Ted, uh, before you before you uh, sign off, we will be posting the recording of this session uh, on our website. Well, somebody show it to Norm Christie so that he'll do an, an episode on it. Norm on his, Christie, his... Norm Christie, I'm trying to remember that <laughs> name. Is it? Is he somebody uh, well known? Uh... World War One ish. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mentored Norm. under I mentored under Norm. Oh, you poor uh, soul. Yeah, that, that's how. Uh, <laughs> We were uh, we had Norm at a branch meeting one time in the uh, sergeant's mess, and uh, as an experiment, I, I live streamed a couple of minutes of it on Facebook, and uh, one of the uh, the woman from um, the uh, you know the department where they they identify fo uh, soldiers unnamed soldiers mm -hmm. I forget her name Glenn would know her name she came and well, spoke to uh, us oh it's uh, it was Laurel Clegg Laurel Clegg. Laura Plague uh, messaged me on Facebook while I was face streaming and she says, oh my God, that man. <laughs> she said she worked with him <laughs> and still has nightmares about it. <laughs> I, I also did a video interview with Norm and uh, 
he was pretty uh, direct in his message in the video. It's, it's on our website as well. Uh, yeah. We love Norm. We'll have to have him back. Let's get him back. Yeah. Uh, you're, you, you ruffle some feathers sometimes when you're pushing the, the ball forward uh, in our, on a research project, but uh, he's another king, king of our history. Um, Michelle, I, I have a quick question for you about the the diary you referenced uh, from the school teacher, the, uh, yep. the civilian that, that hit out. Is that available anywhere in English? I, I just called yesterday. Sadly, I called yesterday e -course, my contact in eCourse St. Quentin because I knew uh, Mrs. Lagrange was still alive. Uh, uh, the last time I talked to him, she was uh, 100. And I said, can, is she well? Can you ask her if her father ever ended up in the French army or not? It wasn't clear when I interviewed them. I think not. I think it was too late for them to, uh, to take part in the war. Uh, and then I asked them, I said, I, uh, I think I, I can't find my copy of Clemence Leroy. It's not handy right now. If I need another one, I said, uh, are they still available? And he said, well, I spoke to the guy who edited the book he's 97 and i said the association will buy what's left so there's none for sale but this guy has some left but he said unfortunately he hasn't gotten back to me the the association just as an investment wanted to buy the maybe 10 or 12 copies that are left uh so i can try and get you one if you uh message me um i can try if, if you if you speak french if you want it uh, it's probably 20 euros uh, plus shipping. It's a thick, thick book. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the daily goings on in occupied France throughout the war. It's a yeah. real treasure. I would be fascinated by that. Unfortunately, I don't speak French, but uh, a resource like that, a story like that to me is uh, intensely interested or interesting. So um, I will send you a note because it's, uh, uh, it's a really cool part of the story. And I think it's relatively timeless uh, for people that endure the civilians that endure conflict around them. But I, I quote in my book, the, the website version, uh, the end, uh, October 1st, when the Ulans first came, first came into ECOR. And then I jumped to September, August 26th. 1918 at the start of the Arras offensive and I pick up uh, George Kentner and what's really interesting is every morning because it was a daily record she complained about the bombardment and she says the bombardment was at six well of course that was German time uh, and uh, George Kentner is talking about in his diary the bombardment at 5 a.m they're taught they're both on either side of the line and they're describing the same bombardment and it's the same, I pick her up again on the 27th, the 28th, and I'm, I, I describe George Kentner's uh, advance to Dury, and then I, 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 uh, I, 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 I interlocked uh, with the memoir of the lady in a course in Quentin until she was evacuated on the 1st of September or 2nd early, uh, but she, she talks about the civilians that were left behind, and she talks about the spire. Uh, she heard. She says, "I heard the spire was ultimately destroyed, uh, was damaged, and uh, the artillerymen state that the uh, the 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 church spire had survived September second, and it's either on September uh, uh, four, uh, fourth or fifth that it was actually hit." And uh, luckily, the uh, the church uh, was heavily damaged, and in, in actually in March 1918, uh, uh, while it was being used as a hospital, and a number of Germans are dead from that, and they're buried locally in the uh, German cemetery. Uh, I have pictures of that, but I, it was it was too off topic. Uh, but the church, uh, the the roof had collapsed, but they replaced the roof and they fixed the spire, and then they replaced the bell, like I told you. Anyway. That's fascinating. I'll be back to you after I've read your uh, online version. My email's on the website. Then please leave comments. I've only got five comments, so I need, I have an <laughs> ego to stroke. So, Michelle, we'll get your um, uh, we'll get your um, contact information. We'll do a follow up email <coughs> to everybody, and we'll get your contact information on there. Your phone or email? Uh, uh, 
whatever you want. Uh, I'm, I always have time for a World War One question. Um, on that uh, note, I just want to sorry. Sorry, Glenn. We we had a request on the chat for uh, the uh, link to Michelle's uh, website. Michelle, what is it? It's www.ecor1918. Dot ca. Maybe I can put it in the chat. I've, I've just done that. Yeah, that's it. You got it right. Ecore yep. 1918. Perfect. Um